Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture about Anderson's fault theory. Let's start with uh, a number of common field observations. Uh, we find that uh, faults uh, are generally of two types, dip-slip faults or strike-slip faults. The dip-slip faults obviously uh, slip along the dip line, like this thrust fault that we see here, or the normal fault that we see here, the movement is along the steepest lineation, the dip line on the fault surface, or in strike slip faults, left lateral or right lateral faults, which are also called uh, sinistral or dextral faults, the slip direction is horizontal, parallel to the strike line of the fault plane. What we find rarely are horizontal faults. One further observation is uh, the distribution of uh, shear stresses and normal stresses. And uh, what we see here is a uh, kind of a stress ellipse uh, that is defined here by a maximum stress vector and a minimum stress vector that are balanced by stress vectors that act in the opposite directions at the same magnitude and all other stress vectors that act in different directions and become smaller and smaller the closer they come from the largest to the smallest stress vector. What we see here on the right hand side is a table uh, that describes uh, the normal and shear stresses acting on all these different uh, plane orientations that we see here from A to S or in the opposite direction um, B prime to S prime. What we see is that there are two specific orientations uh, and these orientations are here. The uh, planes that are perpendicular to one of the principal stress vectors, perpendicular to uh, the largest and perpendicular to the smallest stress vector. These uh, orientations show zero shear stress. In these uh, columns here we see the values of the normal stress and shear stress acting on each of these planes and obviously if you have a plane that is oriented uh, horizontally parallel to the minimum stress in this case of 20 megapascals you will find that all stresses acting on that plane are normal stresses and the magnitude of these stresses would be 40 megapascals uh, that would be the plane s that we see here we see 40 megapascal uh, normal stress, but zero shear stress. At the same time, we find here the plane A, which is parallel to the maximum principal stress, in this case, 40 megapascals. Onto that plane, there are also no shear stresses acting. We see here the zero, and all stresses that we find on this plane are the 20 megapascals of the um, smaller principal stress vector. So in summary uh, what we can conclude is that uh, if we are operating in a stress field with uh, principal stresses which is uh, pretty much every stress field that is not hydrostatic we have a maximum and a minimum stress and planes oriented perpendicular to either of these stresses will show zero shear stress and only normal stress acting upon them. If we put this into the context of a three-dimensional stress ellipsoid with a largest, a smallest, and an intermediate st stress vector, we can define three planes uh, of zero shear stress. Uh, we see here the blue plane is uh, parallel to sigma two and uh, sigma one, and is perpendicular to sigma three. No shear stresses on that plane. No shear stresses we al also find in a plane perpendicular to sigma 1 and on that plane we will find the sigma 2 and sigma 3 stress vector and the third plane of course would be parallel to sigma 1 and sigma 3 and perpendicular to sigma 2. Let's combine that with uh, the observation we made earlier that uh, no common fault types are horizontal. We would presume that the Earth's surface as a horizontal plane is a plane of uh, zero shear stress. That also would imply that 
one of the principal stress directions, sigma 1, sigma 2, or sigma 3, should commonly be vertical. And the other two should be horizontal. Let's combine this with Coulomb failure and a theta angle of 30 degrees. Uh, that allows us to uh, draw a number of uh, principal cases in which falls should fall. And uh, we will see that uh, this, in fact, is uh, the uh, orientation in which we find them. If we put in a stress field defined by sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, the largest principal stress vector vertical, we would find normal falls dipping at 60 degrees because between sigma 1 and the fault plane, we would find our theta angle of 30 degrees. And that implies that the dip angle of the fault itself must be 60 degrees. And these angles obviously also apply to the conjugated fault that we find here with an opposite shear sense compared to the first one. We also find that uh, in this situation, obviously, if sigma 1 is vertical, sigma 3 and sigma 2 must be horizontal. Sigma 2 would plot along the intersection line of the two conjugated faults. And that also tells us that sigma 2 is the only principal stress vector that actually lies on both of these conjugated faults. Let's put sigma 3 vertical. That places sigma 1 and sigma 2 horizontal. And it produces fault planes that dip at 30 degrees. We see here the angle between uh, sigma 1 and the fault plane is uh, 30 degrees. And that angle is the same like this angle here. And obviously also that applies to the conjugated fault over here. Also here we find a theta angle of 30 degrees uh, to uh, this plane. And uh, this produces a dip angle of 30 degrees, but with the opposite sense of shear compared to the first fault. If we place uh, sigma 2 vertical, then we will find vertical faults with opposite senses of shear, of course, if they are conjugated. And uh, we find sigma 1 and sigma 3 horizontal. Again, the same geometrical relationship. Sigma 1 and the fault plane form an angle of 30 degrees. By implication, all these faults that we have discussed would then uh, produce an angle of 60 degrees between sigma 3 and the fault planes. So obviously we find that the geometrical relationship between the stress field and faults is always the same. There are a number of uh, restrictions and caveats to that, but in principle that is how it works. We see here uh, if we have vertical sigma 1 and a horizontal uh, sigma 3 and uh, sigma 2, obviously, we form normal faults. And if we would rotate the stress uh, vectors, then also the, the related faults that would form would rotate. So if our stress field would be oblique, uh, like in this case, our faults would follow suit and would change their orientation they would not change their orientation with respect to the stress vectors. We can carry on our rotation of the stress field and we can uh, perhaps end up in a situation where instead of uh, sigma 1, like in our first block here, now sigma 2 is vertical and we will see that instead of normal faults, we will produce conjugated strike slip faults. The uh, situation between faults and the stress field has not changed at all. Uh, we can play that game in all ways you wish. You, we again start here with uh, normal faults. We rotate in different directions, uh, obtaining oblique slip falls with this oblique orientation of the stress field. And uh, we perhaps end up with thrust falls if we rotate the stress field in such a way that sigma 1 uh, becomes now horizontal and sigma 3 vertical. So if Anderson's uh, fault theory is, is correct and always one of the uh, principal stress vectors is vertical, we easily can explain 
why we find normal faults and thrust faults and strike slip faults so commonly in, in nature. Vertical sigma 1 produces normal faults, a vertical sigma 3 produces thrusts, and a vertical sigma 2 produces strike slip faults. This of course only applies if the rock is mechanically isotropic and uh, if we have a uh, theta angle of 30 degrees. If the theta angle changes and we know it can change plus minus 5 degrees, uh, then also the fault orientation might change. But in principle, uh, the most common faults are following Anderson's fault theory and uh, we hopefully understand now why that is so. So what's about reverse faults? Uh, they cannot be thrusts because they are too steep, but they have the wrong kinematics for normal faults. So what we find in reverse faults are the kinematics of a thrust and the orientation of a normal fault. That does not agree with Anderson's fault theory. We would have to assume that the sigma 1 vector is actually uh, plunging at uh, an angle of uh, around 30 degrees and that would make sigma 3 non-vertical. There are three ways how we can explain reverse faults. They could be reactivated normal faults or inverted graben structures. So if you form first a normal fault, perhaps conjugated faults in a graben system and you later contract this region because uh, the tectonics are changing from extensional to contractional, you might actually use the existing normal faults and overprint them with a reverse movement. That is possible because the pre-existing normal faults would be uh, mechanically weaker and uh, perhaps can be reactivated uh, as uh, reverse faults uh, rather than forming thrust faults at the same time. What we also could find is that uh, blocks form as uh, thrust faults but later undergo rotation. So the fault and its hosting rocks are passively rotated along faults that we might not see in the outcrop and therefore assume a position that is not the position and orientation in which they initially formed. So they look like a reverse fault also they formed actually at a shallower angle as uh, thrust faults. And uh, last but not least, uh, the stress ellipsoid uh, or the stress field could have been inclined, which simply would mean that Anderson's uh, theory or his hypothesis, his premise does not apply. Uh, simply if the stress field is inclined, uh, we might find other faults. Point two and three that we just have discussed also apply to oblique slip faults. Oblique slip faults are those which are a combination of strike slip and dip slip faults. We see here uh, striations along a fault line that are neither parallel to the strike nor to the dip line. And we see here the hanging wall block moving upwards with a left lateral component. So this is a combination of a reverse and a sinister strike slip fault. Here we find uh, another example of an oblique slip fault uh, where we have a normal component and a dextra right lateral component. We see here the hanging wall block moves downwards along this oblique lineation. Also here we might have seen passive tilting of a former Anderson type fault into this uh, random uh, oblique orientation or again a stress ellipsoid that was not in agreement with, with Anderson's uh, ideas, with Anderson's hypothesis. So here we come to a number of limitations of uh, Anderson's fault theory. First, uh, Anderson's fault theory uh, only applies if no passive rotation of the fault after its formation has taken place. Uh, obviously, an Anderson type fault, normal fault, thrust fault, strike slip fault, that later is rotated will no longer be in an orientation predicted by this theory. And uh, practically that would mean we should have a uh, look for possible younger structures that might have caused such rotation. Listric faults are doing that. Listric faults are curved faults along of which uh, blocks might rotate and uh, slip 
uh, typically downwards, most lysteric faults are, are normal faults. Further, no displacement along pre-existing surfaces should have taken place. Uh, we have discussed that in the context of reverse faults, which might be reactivated normal faults. You also very commonly find uh, bedding planes are activated as faults, for instance, if much weaker rocks are interlayered with much stronger rocks, mechanically stronger rocks, uh, then uh, faulting might actually occur along uh, weak layers, although they are not in the preferred orientation of the stress field, which means at about 30 degrees with respect to sigma 1. Bayerly's law uh, applies in that, in that context. Uh, then we uh, would assume uh, that uh, for the strict application of uh, 60 degree dip angles for normal falls or 30 degree dip angles for thrust falls, uh, we would uh, assume that the internal angle of friction is 30 degrees or very close to 30 degrees. Uh, if there is a large variation of that, then again, normal falls might be shallower or steeper uh, and the same applies to thrust falls. And the last point is that the initial premise of Anderson's fault theory applies, and that is one principal stress vector is vertical. If that is the case, if the rock is mechanically isotropic, and if the fault is not rotated at a later stage, then we will find Anderson-type faults. Thank you very much.